Hello and welcome to Africa Today. I am Esther Mokwariola. Dubbed one of the most promising African stories of 2011, South Sudan went on to disappoint global expectations with the world's youngest nation quickly becoming one of the most politically unstable countries in the world. And six years after the nation's flag was hoisted in the capital city of Juba amid an atmosphere of optimism and hope, the National Day of Celebration has gradually become an occasion not to be celebrated, at least for now. And so we ask, what are your thoughts on the lingering political and humanitarian crisis in South Sudan six years after independence? You can join the conversation and share your thoughts with us on Twitter at TVC Connect. A report now to launch the program and Africa Today will continue. Welcome on board. Since January 2017, more than 52,000 refugees have been received in Uganda, with the majority crossing at border entry points. In less than six months, Uganda has more than tripled in its population of South Sudanese refugees, hosting more than half of 1.1 million people who have fled their homes in the neighboring country. This, to an extent, has put a strain on Uganda's resources. $10 million to host 10,000 refugees, and we have 4,000 crossing every day. That means in three days, we have a need to raise almost $10 million to help them out. In the face of these challenges, the United States government announced an additional aid package for Uganda to support its refugee crisis. I'm very happy today just to announce an additional $25.2 million contribution um, that is uh, earmarked for activities in Uganda in response specifically to UNHCR's 2017 supplementary appeal in support of South Sudanese refugees. Although Uganda is widely recognized as having progressive and forward-thinking refugees and asylum policies, the crisis is not something the country can tackle alone. We are managing our country well and there's peace and there's democracy, there's order. And those who are mismanaging their country are causing us problems and they, they must, the world must stand up against that, mm -hmm. against that mismanagement. I can assure you that the U.S. government will do every, has, has historically, and I have every expectation they will continue to do what they can, as will my European colleagues. Uh, obviously, I cannot speak on their behalf, but the real issue is that there are many, many other countries out there in the world today who are capable and have the means and the resources to provide support. After gaining independence from Sudan in 2011, South Sudan descended into a civil war in December 2013, leaving tens of thousands dead and more than 3 million people displaced. Half of the country's population are in need of urgent aid. Experiencing one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world after Syria, South Sudan is said to be on the edge of a cliff with all the ills of ethnic conflict and social fragmentation. The world's youngest nation plunged into war in 2013 after a fallout between President Salva Kiir and his former deputy Riek Marcher, creating a terrible mix of brutal violence, rising hunger and a deepening economic crisis. Joining me in the studio on Africa Today, I have Olayinka Ola Daniels, a lawyer and a political analyst here in Nigeria. Good to have you here on the program. Thank you. My and pleasure. on Skype, I have Matunde Fagbayibu, Associate Professor of Law, University of South Africa in Pretoria, South Africa. Good to have you as well on the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Right. Now, let's begin the show with you, Olayinka. Well, let's start with this. What are your thoughts now on the lingering crisis in South Sudan amid previous efforts to, well, resolve or end this logjam? Well, the situation we have at the moment um, maybe I will look for a word for that in the course of the discussion, <laughs> but I will say it's pathetic mm. and it is sad. Mm. If African, uh, African leaders, I mean, are known for nothing but destructions, I mean, you, was there any blueprint, was there any scope of, uh, I mean, uh, um, anything any, any 
letter, mm -hmm. you know, uh, of moving forward to say, okay, we want independence mm. and we want a nation and we want this nation to flourish. Mm. Do we have any land, uh, any landscape of such? Mm. Because if we do, you got independence in 2011. By 2013, December, we have crisis between the president and the former vice president mm. using ethnic, um, ethnicity um, um, issues, diverse, uh, di uh, dimensions. Mm -hmm. It's sad. If we, we use, now, you are supposed to have a peaceful country. You left Sudan to stand on your own, to cater for your people. Mm. But what do we have instead from, now, from 2013 to 2015? In fact, to 17 right now, from, the, uh, from uh, research, we've discovered over maybe 4 million people. Mm. Over 4 million people had left. The country, some to maybe the, uh, the neighboring, neighboring countries. countries and like that. Hmm. Some are seeking refuge in some other, uh, you know, country. Yeah, really, it, really disheartening. It, it, no food, nothing. Massive displacement. They need to, to uh, what mm. is the government, what is the, what, what is the duty of the government if it cannot invest in its people, if it cannot invest in the economy of the country, if it cannot promote its people and future of the nation. So mm. what is the, what, what is the job? Mm. Of, the, of the leaders if they can fix this. And it's a wake-up call for them indeed at this moment. Well, let me well when we say if it's a wake-up call, yeah. because the wake-up call <laughs> started <laughs> all, all, all the way back, I think yeah. even 15. Yeah. But they're marking their, they mark their six-year anniversary um, on Sunday. Yeah. But seriously, what is the difference? What can we see as improve? What can we say the people are benefiting? from the so-called democracy. I guess nothing much. Well, let's quickly get the thoughts of Babatunde. Babatunde, now would you say the people or the government are to blame for the crisis ravaging the country at the moment? Uh, you see, the case of South Sudan should be placed in any historical context. Um, there's no way we can talk about South Sudan today and not uh, at least understand the roots, uh, the genesis of this crisis. Uh, it takes us back to 1991 specifically, um, when there was a big split in the SDLM between uh, Rick Masha and um, John Garang, the late John Garang, and which also took some sort of um, an ethnic coloration, um, the Dinka being the majority group in South Sudan, and the Noor being the second uh, uh, largest, major, uh, largest group in South Sudan, with um, about 60 ethnic groupings. Um, so this fight has always been between these two elements, the um, the Rick Masha element that later forged an alliance with uh, uh, um, the government of um, Sudan or what you know the northern part of Sudan. So, uh, if we are to place the problem, if we are to place the problem where it should be placed, uh, one would say that all the actors, uh, both uh, you know, um, uh, the, the the current president Salvatier of the SPLM, and also his former vice president, uh, uh, Reid Masha, who was fled to South Africa, uh, we would say they're both complicit. Now, when South Sudan um, gained its independence uh, and, you know, arrangements were made for it, um, uh, through, through the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, certain issues were not taken into consideration. Um, you see, many of these leaders were unable to substitute their um, personal issues, they were, able to, they were able to substitute for the greater good of South Sudan. So you would see this country has been in a, in a total state of chaos um, since, since, since 2011, since it gained independence with factions and armed group. Um, at some point, the SCLA had about 200,000 army officers and I, I had the highest um, number of generals uh, per capita, about 700 generals. Um, and of course, at some point, they did not even know how many people were in the army. So everybody started creating factions, and the way you could negotiate with the government was your ability to bring people uh, and, and to cause chaos, essentially, in the country. So the fight in 1991 again has replayed itself, of course, replayed itself in 2013, when um, there was a big split again between Rick Masha and, uh, and, and Salva Kiir, um, leading to, 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 to further chaos in the country. And of course, their report <laughs> that um, uh, uh, the government of South Sudan engaged in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, you know, some sort of uh, 
uh, wiping of or, or, or slaughtering of ethnic uh, Nuers who were living in Juba in 2013. So again, to go back to your question, who do we blame here? We blame all the political forces. If we are going to arrive at any serious, uh, serious resolution of the South Sudan problem, all of the leaders, all of the leaders have to step aside. Mm. Um, in fact, one thing I would you that um, uh, um, Salva Kiir, the current uh, government of South Sudan, is illegitimate to a very large degree because an agreement was made in 2010 that two years after independence there would be a general election. So people who became the political leaders in 2011 were just there on ad hoc basis, and there's been no, there's not been. Uh, uh, an election since then. So one could argue, I mean, if you want to be, be, be very legalistic about this, to say that there's even no legitimacy on the part of the government, on the part of those who are warring. Mm. And then, um, you know, the popular proverb that says when um, two, two elephants are fighting, the grass suffers. Yeah. So now you find a serious displacement yeah. uh, 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 around the country. Yeah, so quite, quite a disturbing one there, Fagban Yibo. But yes. let's quickly go on a quick break. You're watching Africa Today. We're looking at the lingering political and humanitarian crisis in South Sudan six years after independence. We'll have more discussions when we come back. Coming through a troubled past with South Sudan between 1983 and 2005, oil-rich South Sudan continues to break continental records for the wrong reasons. After more than three years of war, thousands of lives have, lost, have been lost and about four million people are said to be displaced within and outside the country, while six million people are facing life-threatening hunger. Well, Olayinka, you're still with me now. We'll, just before the break, uh, we just had Babatunde Fagbaimbo with, with his own thoughts on this situation that is really, really worrisome. And from what he said, he maintains that all the leaders in question here should step aside and they are to blame for the uh, quagmire, as it were, in South Sudan. But Generally now, the people have suffered enough. Six years ago, they were happy, you know, that they have an independent country and yeah. finally it is here for them. But today, it is a different story. Yes. How much of a concern is this to you? And as an African, hmm. seeing that these people do not have food to eat, they, they, they are living in severe hunger, there are cases of mass displacement, there is famine. What do you think? could be the likely implications of this scenario in South Sudan? We, we see, we are looking at the famine, we are looking at the uh, um, di displacement and whatnot. Mm. But there's some very pertinent thing we have not considered. Now, with the issues going on, the problem going on, do you know that the youth that are supposed to be in school are lured into joining the soldiers. The youth, there's no education whatsoever. Mm. Even the sole buildings uh, that were uh, uh, put up for their education, the crisis, the uh, rebels and, uh, I mean, the militants, they went there, they destroy everything. Mm. So now the future is even dim for them. The youth that's supposed to be the future of the state, of the nation, where are they? Some um, displaced, some don't even know their whereabouts. Some can't even leave. Some, uh, most of them, like I, I think from the research um, so far, I think we saw, I think from UNICEF, I think we saw about um, 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 over two million of the youth. No life, no future, education gone. Yes, even, okay, now, if they are, are, um, they are bothered about power, because all this is about power tussle. Now, I want to be, you want to be, and then you don't even care what happens to the future of your country, then you're not supposed to be there. So I will agree with him if they are so, to leave, but then when they leave, who takes over? Mm, that's a question indeed. Fagba Imbo, I believe you just heard uh, Alain Kerr's position on this, but let's begin with your thoughts on Salvaker's call for international support on the national dialogue. He's positive now, saying that it might pave way for peace. Do you agree with that? As I said earlier, Salvatore Kiev is very complicit. Rick Marshall also very complicit. Yes, the way out of this logjam is um, a, a serious and a robust um, framework 
um, uh, um, to be led by the African Union. As you know, South Sudan became part, a member of the African Union in 2011, um, became a member of, of the East African Community in 2016. So the African Union, the East African Community, IGAD, um, actually uh, there's already an, a, an AU high-level panel headed by the former president of South Africa, um, Mr. Thabo Mbeki, uh, and they've been doing serious work around the country on, in trying to understand some of the some of the problems. So there's already a, there's already some sort of framework, but it has to be strengthened. So you need a framework that has the African Union as the leader, as the primary uh, 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 primary member of of, 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 this, of this framework. You need the United Nations uh, National Security Council to also come on board, uh, and of course. When these two actually come together, they must set some sort of approach on moving forward. Um, and in moving forward here, you have to understand that Salva Kiir cannot be, Salva, neither Salva Kiir nor Rick Machar or any of the political actors should actually be involved. There has to be civil society. You see, um, in 2010, as I earlier mentioned, in 2010 there was an all-party conference um, that actually tried to, to, to chart some sort of way forward for, for South Sudan, where you had um, the church. Um, the church is still very quite powerful um, there, you know, women groups and, and all of those things coming together to chart a way forward. So this has to be resuscitated. So how and workable is that? So knowing that, Fabian, but sorry for interrupting you, how workable is that knowing that the, the players involved in this crisis do not seem to let go? How workable is your, is your proposition? Uh, then, then, you see, uh, then in this situation, then the, the African Union has to turn off the heat. The African Union has to turn off the heat because the inability, the African Union and the United Nations Security Council has to turn off the heat on Saba here. The nation is already down on its knees. Um, in 2016 alone, it recorded 309% inflation, which is the highest, was, was the highest in the world. You know, it's already on its knees. All prices are falling. Um, so uh, there's not much room to bargain, um, you know, on the part of Saba T now. And, but because there's been, uh, there, there's not been any serious um, kind of approach from the African Union and the East African community. That is why you still have situations where Salva Kiir still thinks he has, um, he, has, he has some cards to play with. So when this come, uh, the, the, the uh, actors that I've mentioned, the African Union, the United Nations Security Council, the East African Community, um, and Intergovernmental Authority on Development, when they come together and turn up the heat, you know, play around with sanctions, um, send out messages to the actors and let them know and say we have to create a proper transitional framework. Um, the, the, the Ugandan academic Mahmoud Mamdani, who has done quite a bit on, on South Sudan, has argued that South Sudan is not a failed state. South Sudan is a failed transition. Mm. So what happened was that the transition was so skewed that the outcome of the transition was it's what we have now. People, illegitimate actors, actors who are extremely militarized actors who came to the table with bad blood. All and right, I'll, I'll come back to you in a moment. Let me quickly get uh, the thoughts of Olayinka on this very matter. Do you think sanctions is a way forward to help the situation in South Sudan? Sanction? <laughs> who, who are going to suffer it? Which sanctions? To stop supplying aid? We're going to suffer this. What happened to the, uh, to the signatories? To the signatories of the uh, of the 2015 agreement, Who, where are they? If they are sincere, if the signatories are sincere, they, they should come to a table. If mm. they are sincere with themselves, mm. then they should look at the agreement again and decide whether they want to stay together, whether the agreement will work, whether they want to see it work. Mm. Sanctions. So far, as far as I'm concerned. These people we are talking about are not going to suffer anything. Well, the people. The people. So sanctions come into so how many are there are, are them in total? So what other areas are there now to explore to find lasting solutions in this in the situation? Yes, we, we we've said it. Uh, we're not going to rule out the internet. Uh, the sorry, the African Union mm -hmm. to come. You know, to things like this, and it, it's sad. It's sad. Things like this is happening, and seriously, African Union so far. It's quiet, as far as I'm concerned, because I've, I've not really seen a tangible action 
you know, uh, uh, be, be being, uh, being put together mm -hmm. by the so-called African Union. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are looking for a way forward to see how these things will work, like I said, mm -hmm. the signatories have to come to the table, then when they need to be sincere to each other, to themselves. Okay, what do we want? Let us look at our blueprint. How do we move forward? Mm. Then, if it's about sacrificing your ambitions, like the president and the former um, uh, vice president and every other uh, people involved in this crisis, probably should give way. Mm. Mm. Should give way. Let us look at it. If they need um, African Union to bring in some um, maybe machineries to put things in place, if, then settle before we can move forward. All right, Baba Tunde, I believe you just had uh, a lying cap, but looking at the situation critically, what possible strategy do you think is expected now of the international community to salvage the problem that is growing with concern of humanitarian crisis? Uh, um, the humanitarian crisis, of course, um, you've had many actors again going in and, and trying to, you know, um, bring in aid. Um, to, to solve the humanitarian crisis, but this is a political failure. Um, so the way out of this logjam is a political process. It's a political process, as I said earlier on, and that political process has to start with actors coming together and telling the main actors to step down. You see, um, we are battling with so many things oh, uh, 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 in South Sudan. Yeah, as I said earlier, we are the, the government is illegitimate for all intents and purposes. Uh, the government of, of, of uh, Salvatore is illegitimate for all intents and purposes. So you need to start looking around and asking yourself the role civil society can play. Mm -hmm. There's civil society on the ground. You know, we keep going on as if um, um, there, there are no people who, I mean, they, I know the church was very, very effective. The Anglican church, for example, was uh, actively involved in trying to sort out the crisis in the early years of independence. So you have all of those things. So things have to, uh, and of course, Africa, the South Sudanese in, uh, in diaspora, mm. um, there are quite a number of uh, um, South Sudanese who, who have actually been able to do great things outside of the country, um, who are able to contribute as well mm. to, to, to the peace process. Mm. So everybody has to go back to the drawing table with no condition whatsoever. All so right. um, we don't want to have a clear now placing conditions on the table. So people go back and start looking for the way forward. And the way forward is for the political actors, current political actors, to step down. All right, if on that positive note, down, I'd like to thank you very much. Babatunde Fagwain, we've got some time. We'd like to thank you again for your thoughts on Africa Today. It's a pleasure. Now, let's quickly wrap up with you. And what lessons can be learned from this whole happenings in South Sudan? Well... Um, I, Very I, 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 yeah, I thank you for these questions because some agitators that have been, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to uh, speak to our own dear nation, Nigeria. Right. Some agitators that have been asking for um, um, uh, uh, a session, they want to go, uh, fine, maybe they should look at South Sudan. This is six years and this is what is happening. Mm. Because the question I've been asking the so called agitators that the people, your leaders that are asking for this, have you asked them for the blueprint? Of what they really have in what they have in mind yeah. for a country they want to have, mm. they don't have. They're just making us the same thing. We happen. That is what the question is. When South Sudan was uh, was asking for the independence, independence what do they have on the table mm. as a, a, a nation mm. to move for uh, moving a nation forward and to to stand as a nation? What do they have on the table when they were asking for the independence? This is clearly is we can all see it clearly mm. they had nothing all right yep. and on that note let us thank you very much alain carola daniels lawyer and a political analyst we appreciate your thoughts on thank the program now for a country virtually on life support south sudan tells a story of shattered dreams wasted potentials and a fading future amidst high expectations that once trailed the country's independence six years ago now to ensure south sudan doesn't have to cancel the next national birthday Africa and the world can't continue to stand and watch as a selfish political class plunge the world's youngest nation into further doom. And that is our package for today. But don't forget to join the conversation as usual on Twitter at TVC Connect. And also follow me for updates around Africa at Esther TVC News. On to the next one. I am Esther Macquariola. Bye for now. <laughs>